Okay, so welcome to lecture 13. This is the final lecture for data mining at Google. There's a, a homework posted for the last one that I told you about. Today I'm gonna to finish up chapter five. We started into chapter five before. We're gonna finish it up today. And then I'm gonna do a little bit on chapter eight, which deals with clustering, just enough to give you a introduction to that. Okay, so there is the homework assignment. There's some information about the final the students are taking next week. Chapter five is on alternative techniques for classification. We got into it last time. Ensemble methods were the one thing that we didn't finish up. And ensemble is a very general category that talks about combining different classifiers. And your book says the aim is to improve classification accuracy by aggregating the predictions from multiple classifiers. One of the most obvious ways to do this is simply to take a majority vote. So take the straight average of classifiers, right? So each classifier makes a prediction. You take some fixed number of classifiers, then you take the majority vote. And the whole idea there is that if they're acting somewhat independently, then you can improve your performance. And the examples I gave you were some toy examples. Suppose you have five classifiers that are each correct 70% of the time for a given data point. If these things were completely independent and you took the majority vote, well then the majority vote is gonna be correct if all five of them are correct, if four of the five of them are correct, or if three of the five of them are correct, then the majority vote will be correct. And you can calculate this thing, which we did last time, and I believe it comes out to be about 84%. So you're improving your accuracy from 70% for the individual classifier to 80% for the ensemble. Let me just bump up the font size here to, let's say, 14. Okay, so the ensemble would be 83 or 84% accurate, even though each individual classifier is only 70% accurate. Now this is sort of the ideal, right, where you have complete independence, but as long as you get them somewhat uncorrelated, you can hope to achieve this type of benefit. The next example I gave you was, suppose I had 101 classifiers, and each of these was completely independent, and they were each getting the point correct 70% of the time, how well would the majority vote do? Well, for 101, you just have to have 51 or more of them correct and then the majority vote is gonna be correct. So the probability there, again, you can figure out using the binomial distribution. And this thing comes out to, I think, like four, four nines. Let's see how this one is. Comes out to be point nine 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 eight seven. So if things were completely independent, if you were in a perfect world, you could just take a majority vote and you would do perfectly. Now, of course, things aren't going to be completely independent, but again, to the extent that the different classifiers you're averaging are somewhat uncorrelated, you can improve performance to some degree. Okay, so what are the different methods of attempting to do this in practice? Well. As ensemble methods, your book's in, book includes bagging, random forest, and boosting. Now, bagging and random forest generally follow this, what I'm talking about in terms of taking averages and hoping that things are pretty independent. Boosting is a little more complex. It's gonna benefit from this averaging, but it's also doing some, some sort of more structural optimization that we'll talk about. But bagging and random forest are really along this spirit of straight averaging. So what does bagging do? Well, it builds different classifiers by training on repeated samples with replacement from the data. So I know it's a little a little dark, but I'm just going to scribble something on the whiteboard if I can find a marker. So with bagging, you imagine, suppose I have 100 points, right? So my training data is 100 points. Okay. And so I say, I, want, I, can, I can build a classifier on 100 points, but I don't want to build just one classifier. I want to build many different classifiers so I can average them together and take the majority vote. So what we do with bagging is we're going to make different classifiers by training on repeated samples from the same data. So let me take the 100 points and sample 100 points with replacement. Okay, so that would be the exact same points, except I'm doing it with replacement. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get some points zero times, some points two times, maybe a few points three times, and sort of like that. And then I can do it again, right? So the whole point is that I don't just want one classifier, I want a large number of classifiers so I can average them together. So with bagging, you just keep taking samples of with replacement. It could be from the, of the same sample size. You could use a smaller sample size if you wanted, but from your original data. That gives you a number of different classifiers. They're, of course, not completely independent. They're trained on a lot of the same data, but they might be somewhat uncorrelated. And if you have a really, really noisy, really unstable classifier, by doing this and then taking averages, you can sort of smooth it out and achieve some benefit and improve your performance. So 
And this is the general idea behind bagging. It's a very general approach, right? You can use this not just for classification, but you can do any type of technique. You can do bagging on your data, average the results, and then hope to improve performance. So I'm not going to give you too much details about bagging, but you can read about it. And basically, that's the idea, is that I just take samples with replacement from my original data, build uh, the classifier on each one of the subsamples, and then average them together. And it has a nice effect of smoothing things out. If you talk about the bias versus variance trade-off, you decrease the variance, but you, you haven't sacrificed sacrifice any of the bias. Okay. Random forests, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on those. That's a little bit different. It's sort of along the same spirit of, of bagging, but instead of sampling the observations, right, the rows, they often sample the columns or the attributes. So I'll give you some details about bagging on the next slide. And then the last thing we'll talk about with regard to ensembles are boosting, which, again, it benefits from some averaging, but it also does something a little more intelligent, where it looks at the points that are getting classified incorrectly and it upweights them. So I'll give you some details about that. But first, let me talk to you about random forests. So you can see here, as the name implies, it's going to be specific to trees. Random forests, forests, forest is a collection of trees, whereas bagging, in principle, you could do with any type of classification technique, and in fact, with a lot of other techniques, you could use bagging. Boosting can work with any base classifier, although commonly these are used with trees, but random forest, as the name implied, is a specific algorithm for use with trees. And how random forest works is the following. So one way to do it, basically, with random forest, you want to average a whole bunch of trees. So how are you going to get a whole bunch of trees that are somewhat independent? Well, what they're going to do is the following, right? You start off like you're growing a tree, like we did back in chapter four, and you have your root node. OK. And then you need to find sort of the best split. In chapter four, we found the best split. Well, what random forest is going to do, it's not going to find the best split. It's going to find a split that's good, but somewhat random. So if you imagine, instead of sampling the rows, we're going to sample the attributes, as I said. So if like the sonar data with 60 attributes, instead of finding the best split from all 60, maybe you just take 10 of the attributes. OK, and of those, from those 10 attributes, you find the best split. OK, so then that gives you sort of two other nodes here. And then you have to split those nodes. Well, again, you sample of the 60 attributes, just randomly sample 10 of the attributes. And from those 10, you find the best split. And over here, maybe you randomly sample another 10 attributes. And from those 10, you find the best split. So it's not the optimal tree. But the nice thing, it has this sort of random component. So then you can come over here and do it again. Start with the same terminal node, sample 10 different attributes from the 60, form the best split on those 10, then do it again over here. And so all these trees are going to be somewhat different because the splits aren't optimal. They're somewhat random. I take a random subset of the columns, find the best split on that random subset of the columns, and grow the tree. And actually, they grow these trees in random forests pretty big. right? They don't really attempt to sort of prune them back too much. They just sort of let them grow pretty big. But then you get a whole bunch of different trees, right? All these trees. Each one gives me a guess, right? This one says, oh, I think it's a negative one. This one says, I think it's a positive one. This one says, I think it's a positive one. Then you take the majority vote among those trees, and that gives you your prediction. Okay, so we said trees aren't that useful in terms of, you know, decision trees aren't that, aren't that powerful of a classifier, but using decision trees in some method like this, like random forest, can be very useful. So again, these are very effective. They're based on the paper. Of course, these are Leo Ryman's invention. If any of you had the privilege of meeting him before he passed away, he was up at Berkeley, really smart, really nice guy. And this machine learning paper from 2001 is a very readable paper where he describes the algorithm and talks about why it works. Why does it work? Well, because you don't, you still, the trees are still on biased, but you, you decrease the variance by doing this randomization. There's a function in R called random forest, one word. The R is not capitalized, the F is in the library of the same name that will fit these. You can read the documentation on that. You can read the machine learning paper from 2001. Also, Adele Cutler keeps up the website and sort of gives all the updates to the algorithm and supports it on that website. Uh, is there anything else I need to say on this slide? I think I said everything on this slide. Let me show you in practice. So if you look at the sonar data set, here I can fit a random forest to the sonar data set. Basically, just install random forest, do library random forest, read in the training data, read in the test data. Now again, I want to have y as a factor so that r knows that the 61st column of the sonar, which was the negative one or one, is the categorical predict the categorical response that we're trying to predict. And then the testing data is the other, the first 60 columns. And then so the random forest, by default, I just say fit random forest x comma y, right? 
give me the training data x's, give me the training data y's, that's going to fit a random forest. And then I can use my predict function on that object, predict my fit, predict it for my testing data, and see how often this prediction from the testing data equals the truth, the true y from the testing data, which of course this algorithm did not see. Take one minus that and divide it by the sum, and that will give me my class of misclassification error rate on the test data. And so let me just paste this thing into R. And so if you remember how well we were doing, I'll write down sort of the results from the Bake Off before, but this thing gives me 15.3% misclassification error. Now, of course, it is random, right? It's growing different trees each time. So if you do it again, you might get a different number. Here I got 16.7. You do it again, you get 14.1. You do it again, you get 16.7. So there is a random component, so the non-deterministic. But of course, I don't have too much confidence. That one's actually really low. I don't have too much confidence in these numbers anyway, because they're just based on a single partitioning of the data into training and test. If you wanted to get a better, more confidence in the numbers, you might do it repeatedly over that too. But this thing looks like it's coming in between, you know, 10 and 16 percent. So if you remember the the Bake Off we were having, right, on the sonar data set, which this is also being applied to the sonar data set. The first thing we looked at in chapter four were the decision trees from our part. And I said that those aren't very, oops, those aren't very accurate. And I think we were only getting about 30%, maybe a little bit better for our part. So that was about 30% on the sonar data. We did nearest neighbor one. We got about 20, 21%, I think. On the homework, I asked the students to sort of figure out, you know, if nearest neighbor one gives 21%, how do two and three and four do? And they do a little bit better, but you're not, you don't do too much better. You're still around like 19%. Then last time we looked at support vector machines, and those did really well. Those were like 12.8%, so we call it like 13%. And this guy is arguably competitive to that, right? Here's a 15%, here's an 11%. So we'll put uh, random forests random forests, um, I'll put them at about 13% too. They're very competitive to support vector machines. I mean, sort of I would say our part, nearest neighbors, you know, not so good, just not only on this data set, but in general. But support vector machines are a very popular technique. They're popular because they're effective. Random forest is a very popular and effective technique. It's about 13%. And the last one, of course, I'll show you today is boosting, which is also going to be competitive on this data set and many other data sets as well. But again, random forest is a pretty simple technique, but there's some strong motivation. I mean, Leo Bryman understood well what the failure of decision trees was. The failure of decision trees is that they tend to be very sensitive, and he said you can improve the performance by averaging them. He was working on these at the same time boosting was a hot topic, and he realized that they were sort of both benefiting from this averaging, and he developed in the end of the day a classifier that's very competitive and a lot of people use it. It's pretty simple, but he gives a lot of intuition in the paper for why it works. Basically, he shows you that you can make these trees very uncorrelated, right? You can't make them perfectly independent, but you can make them very uncorrelated, and then taking the averages will work well. And he actually gives some theoretical bounds on the performance in terms of the correlation and the accuracy of each tree. So again, that paper is pretty readable. OK, so I think that's all I wanted to say about random forest. Any comments, questions, thoughts about random forest? So is random forest particularly appropriate when I have very high dimensionality in exactly. my Exactly. Right. So the question is, is random forest appropriate for high dimensional data set? And exactly. That's, and, and the converse of that is if you have a low dimensional data set, you're not going to benefit too much by taking random, random columns, right? Because there's only so many columns you can take. There are, are other versions of random forest. You can have different components that become random. But one of the popular implementations is to select random columns. And if you have a lot of columns in high dimensional data, many of which are redundant, then that's sort of, that's sort of a good recipe for using random force. High dimensional data, a lot of redundant information, and so you sort of randomly select the columns. And that gives you different trees, uses all the information, but doesn't overfit and doesn't suffer so much from the curse of dimensionality. OK, other questions, comments on random force? Uh, so, the question is how many trees? Um, I forget what the default is. I, I think it's generally in the hundreds. Let me just see if I can see here. Random forests. See if there's a default value. Oops. Uh, 
what did I type it? Random forest. There's only one forest, many trees. Okay. So let's see if there's, um, I don't know the default value of how many trees he's fitting. Is that it? Where do you see it? First line. First line. N number of trees, probably 500. Let's see. Where's N tree? Yeah. Under Y test. Number of trees to grow. Perfect. This should not be set to too small a number to ensure that every input row gets predicted at least two times. There you go. So default is 500. And, you know, you can experiment with changing these values. Also, one thing I didn't say about random forests is they're not only are they good at classification, they're also good at probability estimates. So the number of trees that predicted as plus one is a good surrogate for the probability, the conditional probability that that point is plus one. So if you if you have a bake-off not just in terms of classification error but in terms of probability estimation, random forests often beat things like support vector machines and boosting where it's not so obvious how you get a probability estimate out. Okay, so 500 trees looks to be the current default. The, the package is updated frequently too, so you should, you know, if you have installed it last year, you might want to reinstall it this year and get the new version. Okay, any other questions, comments on random forests? Yeah, isn't there a way you can get, like, you can estimate their, like, test data performance without actually partitioning the data because you, like, for each observation? Mm -hmm. just some the trees that didn't use that observation. Exactly. So, so Charles' question is, you know, here I have a split, training data and test data. That's how I've been having my bake-off. But random forest just by itself, just on the training data, actually will give you a, a nice estimate of its performance on future data because every time it's not using the data and it has sort of this built in. So one of the things you get, I said you get probability estimates for free, you also get a nice estimate of how well you're going to do on future data. Okay. And the, the how well you do on the training data has very little to do with that, but this is sort of intelligent enough to give you a good estimate of the generalization error to future data. Okay. Any other things on random force? Okay, so the last ensemble technique to talk about is boosting, which doesn't fit so well. I mean, it's, it's going to benefit from this averaging, but it's doing something else too. Uh, Leo Bryman actually called boosting the best off-the-shelf classifier in the world. There are a number of explanations for, for boosting, but it's really not completely understood why it works so well. People, some people in machine learning have an interpretation of it. They say, oh, it's a large margin classifier. Some people in statistics say, oh, it's doing stage-wise optimization of something that looks like a likelihood function. People disagree about why it works so well, but people generally agree that it does work well, and it's a very popular and effective technique. The most common version of it, when some people talk about boosting, they're implicitly meaning the Adaboost version, which was from this 1996 paper by Freund and Shapir. And you know, these two, they're still very active in the research to sort of understanding why this works. I mean, basically, they have an algorithm. They have some motivation for why it works, but people don't generally agree on why it works. But again, people do agree that it does work well. One of the debates around it is whether or not it overfits and how often it overfits, because that's sort of the surprising thing about it, that it doesn't overfit. And that's what I say here in the second point. It usually gives zero training error, but rarely overfits, which is very curious, because if you look at the algorithm on paper, it looks sort of like a recipe for disaster because it's so aggressive in trying to classify everything correctly. It can use any classifier as its base classifier, which is called the weak learner. So that's the idea behind boosting is that you take sort of a weak classifier, like you can think of a very small decision tree that's not going to be able to learn all the data because it's just a very simple tree. But it takes that and it boosts it up makes it stronger. How does it do that? Well, it combines many trees, but not just in an averaging sort of way, in a way that's aggressive at trying to learn the whole data, because it takes a small tree. Wherever that small tree makes mistakes, it gives those weights, those points higher weight, puts another tree on top of that, combines those two trees in a very aggressive fashion so that it can get every point correctly. Whatever points it's still getting wrong, it gives those points even higher weight, takes a third tree, puts that on top, tries to learn those points. Uh, so on paper, it looks like it's doing an optimization. In fact, the way it's doing this upweighting, it's, it's optimizing something that looks like maximum likelihood estimation in statistics. In fact, the function that it's optimizing is the exponential loss, which looks a lot like the binomial log likelihood. 
So even though it looks like an optimization on paper, in practice it also benefits a lot from the averaging like Random Forest does, and this is what some of the debate is about. Again, I said it works by upweighting points at each iteration which are misclassified. There do exist R libraries for boosting, so you think, okay, I could just read in the R code and say, okay, here's boosting. But the warning I'll give you is that these are generally written by statisticians, right? R tends to be something that's popular in the statistics community, so the R libraries for boosting are generally written by statisticians. Statistic, st excuse me, statisticians have their own sort of personal biases about boosting, so I generally wouldn't encourage you to use the R, R libraries for boosting, although things like GBM are pretty popular. One thing to do is simply to write your code, write the code yourself, because the algorithms are very simple, so add a boost is like four lines of code. You can try the built-in libraries too, but at least try something like add a boost, which is very simple, and write it yourself, because it generally will do a lot better than some of the libraries that are existing in R already. So here's the code. This is the Adaboost code. So how does this work? So you start off with a classifier. I'll just call it lowercase g. And so this classifier itself will give you an estimate of the class, negative one or one. So you can think if it helps you of, of g as being a very small tree, right? So maybe like a four node tree. So I just grow a little four node tree to the data. And this is gonna spit out either negative one or one. It either thinks every point is either negative one or one. Okay, so it's gonna get some wrong, it's gonna get some right. It's just a very small tree. Okay, the next thing to do is to compute the error rate for that tree. In fact, it's the weighted error rate, but I'm gonna initialize my weights as one on n. The weights will always sum to n. I initialize them at one on n. So I compute the weighted error rate for this tree with the fraction of points that it's getting wrong on the training data, okay? And the log odds, which is one half log of one minus d over e. And this thing is sort of how bad it's doing. Um, if, if it's doing worse than 50%, you can actually see this thing will become negative and flip the sign. And so then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the tree times this alpha multiplier, right? So this alpha is just a scalar, but it could be negative, right? So I'm gonna take the tree times the alpha, mul alpha multiplier, and so that's gonna spit out negative alpha or alpha. So on the first stage, I'm either gonna have negative alpha or alpha for every point. I initialize m at zero. So at stage one, f is either negative alpha or alpha. Okay, my final classifier is gonna be based on the sign of f. So at stage one, my final classifier is equal to the original classifier, right? Because multiplying by alpha doesn't change the sign. Oh, or if it does, then it's just gonna be the opposite of the original classifier. So if the original classifier does better than 50%, at stage one, I'll be equal to the original classifier. If it did worse than 50%, it'll be the opposite of the original classifier. Okay, so stage one is that interesting. Stage two is interesting, right? Because I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna refit my base procedure. I'm gonna fit another four node tree for example, to the training data. But again, I'm gonna use the weights. And so the whole key is how I update the weights. And the way you update the weights is you take the old weights and you multiply by e to the negative alpha g times y. Okay, so that's the whole key. The weight update, the new weights equal the old weights times e to the negative alpha g times y. So I said I'm gonna upweight the points that I get wrong, and that's exactly what this is going to do, right? If g and y disagree in sign, that means it's wrong. That means this would be negative. That means this would be positive. e to a positive number is big. Okay, if G and Y agree in sign, this would be positive, times negative alpha would be negative, it would get a small weight. So the points that it got wrong get high weight, the points that doesn't get, that it gets correct get low weight. And you can also think of this, this G as being sort of a, sorry, you can also think of the, the alpha times G as giving you sort of um, how wrong it is, right? So you don't just get the, the negative one or one, you actually get a confidence weighted prediction. And so you, the points that you think you're getting wrong and you're really confident and actually get really high weight. So it's not just a binary weighting in terms of right or wrong, it's in terms of how wrong you are based on your confidence. Okay, so this is the up update for the weights. And then again, you go through, grow the tree with those new weights. So again, I'm giving trees as an example, but it works with any classifier that accepts weights. And then you go through, compute the weighted error rate for that new tree, again, half its log odds, and then you update again. So originally you had alpha plus g for the first classifier, now you add alpha plus g for the next classifier. So your final classifier, right, is just the sum of alpha g's, right? At each stage you have a tree g and some multiplier alpha. Okay, and then you're just gonna threshold on the sign of that thing. So again, it's just a linear combination of trees, 
that's your final class for the linear combination of trees, where the alphas are chosen according to this formula, which is based on the error rate for each tree, and the Gs are grown on the training data, but using weights, where the weights are smart enough to update the points that it's been getting wrong. And then, of course, you go back through and update the weights again, and so now if you're still getting the point wrong, it's going really high weight, right? And eventually you're going to get right. In fact, you can prove sort of under some mild conditions that even with a very, very simple weak learner, this thing will eventually be able to get all the data, all the training data correct. It will be eventually able to classify all the training data correctly under some mild conditions as long as you run it for a sufficiently long time. Okay, so I said this algorithm repeats until it shows in stopping time. When should you stop? Well, that's sort of up in the air, but generally people run this for like a thousand iterations, something like that. And again, the final classifier is based on the sign of F. F is equal to this linear combination of trees. So you just threshold at zero. Everything that's positive you say is positive one. Everything that's negative you say is negative one. So again, it's just four lines of code, a very simple algorithm to run. Uh, here I'm going to implement it for you, and you can see how to do this. So again, I'm going to look at it on the sonar data and train it on the training data, see how well it does, see how well it does in the test data. This slide is sort of uninteresting. I'm just reading in the data. Here I'm going to initialize some things. So my training error is going to be my misclassification error on the training data. Let me just, I'm going to run it for 500 iterations, so initialize that at zero. Test error, same thing. The F and the F test, these are my, my capital F. I guess I wasn't consistent on the capital lowercase, but this is just my F from the algorithm. And I'm going to initialize it as zero. It's going to be 130 because there's 130 points in the training data. There's going to be 78 because there's 78 points in the test data. I is one. I'm going to iterate over I. I need the library R part because I'm going to use default R part as the base learner. OK, so here's the loop. Right? Loops are slow in R, but this is easy to write in a loop. So while I is less than or equal to 500, this weight formula should be a little bit mysterious to you. Maybe I should explain why that's the weight formula. I gave you the weight update formula, but this is sort of the weight formula. The weight is e to the negative y f, and that actually does the same thing. e to the negative y f does the same thing. Why? Well, it happens to be just look at how f is updated and look at how the weights are updated, right? f is updated by adding alpha plus g. I'm telling you that the weight should be updated by multiplying by e to the negative alpha g. Okay, so this, you know, alpha times g uh, times y is the same thing there when I multiply by e to the negative alpha times g times y. It's the same thing as f, which adds alpha times g. So, so I can just, you know, do that, right? I'm going to multiply. In either case, I'm multiplying by y, but here I just have e to the negative alpha times g, and here I add it here on this scale, and here I multiply on the exponential scale. So this, this weight formula is equivalent to if I had done the weight updates. So either way, you can do it there. The uh, weight should be normalized to sum to 1. Not, you know, our part will still tolerate it, but it's nice to keep these on a, a scale so that they're not all machine 0. Fit our part. Basically, the default call to R part, except I give it the weight argument, which on the first pass is just one, nothing interesting, but eventually I'm going to start upweighting the points that it's getting wrong. And of course, method equal class. The G here is just the negative one or one, depending on the prediction from R part. So actually, in this case, I actually spit out the probabilities threshold at 0.5. So if the probability is bigger than 0.5, it's negative one plus two is one. If it's less than 0.5, it's negative one. So G is just negative one or one. Same thing for G test. I'm just tracking my prediction on the test data, so I want to see how well I'm doing on the test data. E, again, is the weighted error rate. So wherever y and g differ in sign is an error, times w, sum that up, that's the weighted error rate. Then alpha, 0.5 log of 1 minus e over e, just like in the algorithm. Then I'm going to update the f, right? How do you update the f? You take f plus alpha times g, just like here, right? f equal the old f plus alpha times g. So just add on the tree, giving it coefficient alpha. And then I do the same thing on test, right? I take my f test, add alpha times g, just because I'm trying to track my predictions on the test data. So then the other, the real thing I want to know is the training error and the test error. So the training error is the fraction of points where f and y differ in sign on the training data, and on the test data where f and y differ in sign on the test data. And then I'm just going to increment i by 1 there. OK. So if you do this thing, actually, maybe I'll do it in real time for you in case that adds more drama to it or something. Let's, uh, <laughs> where is this thing here? So 
let's see. This is just reading in the data. So really, I mean, there's only a few lines of code there that are doing anything. Most of this is just sort of reading in the data and initializing things here. And I'll use the default R part. You can use any learner that accepts weights, but I'll just use the default R part, which is something that you know is not a good classifier, right? You know that it had 30% misclassification error on the test data. And I'll start my loop here and then finish it here. Let's see. And so loops in R are slow, right? This is doing a pretty simple calculation only 500 times. But whenever you're writing R syntax, you know, avoid writing a loop because it's slow, as this one is. And then the last thing I'm going to do is make a picture. And I'm going to make a picture. I'm just going to plot the test error with a line, put the y scale from 0 to 0.5, because a classifier can't be worse than 50%. Well, it won't be worse than 50%. And on the x-axis, I'm going to put the iterations. Right? You really you only care about the final value after the thing is done. But it's interesting to see what it's doing in between. And if it were overfitting at some point, you know, I would start to see this, this test error go up. Line width 2. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the training error, plot that on the same graph in a different color, and put a legend. So let's see if this thing is done running and I can make its picture. Yep, it's done running. OK. So I will make the picture this way and see what it looks like. OK. So. Does that work? Yeah, OK. So first thing to notice is that if you look at the training error, right, a default call, to, default call to R part will not give you a perfect fit to the training data, right? I guess it looks like it's there. But after about three or four or five, maybe this is 10 iterations, I can pull up the training error and look at it. But after not too long, the boosting algorithm has taken the default call to R part and used the weights in an intelligent fashion to actually give you a perfect fit to the training data after just a few iterations. OK, so that's really how the boosting works. It takes some, you know, the default R part tree does not fit all the observations perfectly. But when you do this weighting in this aggressive fashion, you will. And so the training error hits 0 pretty early on. Now, some people would tell you, oh, the training error is 0. You know, you've probably already overfit. But the interesting thing is, you know, you can just keep running this algorithm. The fact that the training error is 0 doesn't sort of make things stop, because it's all based on this continuous value of f, which is not just negative 1 or 1. It's this confidence rate of prediction. So the algorithm doesn't depend on you know, having errors. So you know, the weighted error rate still makes sense, even though everything is, is an error. It still, it, it still makes sense. And so you can still keep the algorithm going. So the training error zeroes out really early on. If you look at the test error rate, you actually see it just keeps going down. Right? So what, what do you expect to see? You expect to see it like shoot way off and overfit, but it doesn't. And that's what's curious about, about boosting, is that it really looks like it should be overfitting on paper, and that the test error should just go, you know, just blow up. And it doesn't. And in fact, it just seems to benefit more and more the more you run it. So that's one thing that's interesting. The other thing that's interesting is if you trace this value back over here, and I'll just pull it up on the screen, it's going to be competitive to whatever other sort of algorithms you've thought of. So let's see, test error. There you go, 14.1. So, oh, I erased the other guys. But if you remember, you know, SVMs were about, you know, 13%. So 14% without doing anything very intelligent other than calling R part, which by itself is a pretty lousy classifier. I actually took a lousy classifier and boosted it to make it into a good classifier. So that's sort of the story with boosting. Um, again, there's a lot of research in this area in terms of understanding why this thing works. People have different ideas why it works. Generally, people agree that it works. It's a pretty simple procedure, but very effective. And it can learn in noisy situations. It can learn in non-noisy situations. It can learn in very complex situations. It's a very useful technique. It just needs a base learner that accepts weights. And then you sort of put in these four lines of code, do the reweighting, and just let it run. And it does well. So I think that was probably all I was going to say about it. Here's the picture up on the slide. OK, questions, comments, thoughts on boosting? OK, so you'll read a lot of interesting thoughts on this. It's still an active research area, even though this original algorithm was in 1996. 
A lot of people like to argue about why it's working, how it's working. A lot of people argue that it's not working. A lot of people like to change the algorithm to make it work the way they think it should work. But you know, keep an open mind when you read these things, because people have their own biases, and they often like to map it into their own research areas and say, ah, boosting works precisely because of all the research I've done you know, during my career. And that's the real secret. So you know, keep an open mind on this thing. It's basically an algorithm that works well, has a few different motivations behind it, both of which probably make sense in different settings, but generally people don't agree on why it works. And uh, there's a lot of sort of debates around it. OK, so I think that's all I wanted to say about chapter five in general. Any comments, questions on classification? Yeah. I have a question about the boosting. Mm. Can that be combined with SVM? So I mean, you could boost an SVM, right? Um, generally, an SVM is already a pretty powerful learner that can get everything, you know, so you generally wouldn't want to. But yeah, I mean, you could do something like, okay, let me call the default SVM and then call it with up, you know, anything that takes weights, you can boost, right? But it makes sort of more sense to take sort of really weak learners and boost them. But in principle, anything that takes weights, you could boost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have observations that mm -hmm. are kind of weighted a priori, like you want them to have a certain weighting, mm -hmm. uh, can you just start iterating the weights? No, it's, it actually will do unweighting. So we, we, we tried this because we used to try and, so the goal was, so Charles's question is, what if you have observations that already have weights and you want to keep those weights in there? Can you just initialize the weights other than one? So this actually doesn't work very well because it sort of unlearns the weights. This came up when we were trying to get probability estimates out of boosting. So a lot of people think boosting already gives you probability estimates by taking the, you know, going through the link function, but those don't work that well. So what we were trying to do is we were trying to get probability estimates out by weighting one of the classes higher than the other. But that, yeah, it tends to not work because it tends to sort of reweight it for you. So if you want to weight points in boosting, what you really have to do, one thing you can do is replicate them and then jitter them a little bit. And that's sort of hacky, but it, it tends to work. Um, anything short of that, I, I'm not aware that it really works because if you just give them, if I just say, okay, I'm going to weight this half the data twice as much as this half the data, it's going to sort of relearn the weights for you and going to sort of mess them up and might give you something as, as if you hadn't done any weighting. Is there a way to uh, set sort of a theoretical limit to how well any classifier could do on this training data? All right, so the question is, you know, how well can any classifier do on this to training data? So there is a limit, right, and that's, that's how well the Bayes rule would do if you knew what Bay the Bayes rule was, right? So if you imagine data, right, so suppose I had two-dimensional data and I say, okay, I'm going to flip a bias coin here and 20% of these are pluses and then 20% of these are minuses. So it'd be real uh, silly to say I'm doing better than 20% misclassification error on that data, right? Because that's just the theoretical limit. So you know, the, the feeling is we're probably approaching it on the sonar data, right? That, that's, that there's probably some bound around like 10% where it'd be silly to say you could actually do better than that because there's probably some level of non-determinism in that data. But you, know, you don't know what it is for real data, which is why often people, when they write papers, will use simulated data because then they know what the real story is and it's sort of it's easier to study. On the sonar data, you don't really know what the real story is, so it's difficult to, to say what the limit is. But we're probably hitting it. I don't think anyone's going to say, hey, I have a method that gets 5%. You know, it's, it's probably, it's not a deterministic data set. There are some deterministic data sets out there where the limit's zero, right? But there is a rule. But in this case, it's observational data, so it's probably can't go down to 0%. OK, any other questions, comments on classification? OK, so the last thing to do is uh, chapter 8, which is called cluster analysis. So I'm just going to spend, I guess, 20 minutes on this. It's sort of a personal bias, maybe, that I don't think clustering is quite as interesting as classification. But you can disagree with me on that. But I'm still not going to spend more than 20 minutes on it. So um, anyway, clustering uh, divides data into groups that are meaningful, useful, or both. Uh, it's similar to classification, only now we don't know the answer. We don't have the labels. So for this reason, clustering is often called unsupervised learning, right? We don't have someone supervising us to tell us whether we got the answer right or wrong, whereas classification is often called supervised learning, right? We're trying to learn a rule, but then we, we get to find out on the test data where we right or wrong. So your book talks about that on page 491. So you say, well, how in the world could you do you know, any, any sort of learning without knowing the answer. Well, in some cases, it wouldn't make sense, right? So in this case, you know, I have some pluses here and then some pluses here and some minuses here, you know, and they're all sort of jumbled together and I, I have to learn some rule to separate these guys, right? So in that case, if you didn't know the answer, how in the world would you learn some rule? But imagine the case like this, which often happens 
I have some pluses here and then some minuses here. And you say, oh, well, the rule is obvious, right? There's the two groups. Well, you could get that rule. You could see that there's two groups even if you didn't have the labels, right? Even if you had a bunch of pluses here and a bunch of pluses here, you can see, oh, there's some grouping, right? These guys look like they live in some group together, and these guys look like they live in some group together. And these groups are meaningful because these guys are all similar to each other, these guys are all similar to each other, and these guys are all pretty different to each other. So like the within group variation is small, between group variation is big, so you can define groups. You won't really know, is this the right grouping, but it seems like it stands out. Um, I should say here while I'm talking about, so the supervised learning versus the unsupervised learning, there's also this area right now called semi-supervised learning, which is sort of a hot area right now, which attempts to sort of combine both these methods, right? So if you had the data that looked like this, and most of the data wasn't labeled, but then you have just like a couple points here labeled as negative, and a couple points here labeled as positive, well, you could do two things, right? You could pretend like you don't have the labels and do clustering, or you could pretend like you do have the labels and you only have four points to train on, or you could try and combine the two approaches, which is what's called semi-supervised learning, which is sort of a hot topic right now to combine these two. Okay, so because there's no right answer, your book characterizes clustering as an exercise in descriptive statistics rather than prediction. So it's sort of in the same category of stuff we did in chapter three where, you know, let's make a, a picture of the data and see what it looks like, right? It's not like there's a right answer, we're just trying to understand better what's going on in the data. Uh, your book says cluster analysis groups data objects based only on information found in the data that describes the objects and their similarities. The goal is that objects within a group be similar to, related to one another, and different from or unrelated to objects in other groups. So that's generally the idea. You want to keep things similar within the group and different when you go across groups. Examples that you've probably seen, right, from your high school science class. We always group living creatures into kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And in fact, this clustering has a special hierarchical structure where, you know, the, the species inherits traits from the genus and, and so on. So, you know, there's no right answer, right? You know, there's not like God or some creator is going to come down and say, you guys have had this wrong all along, right? These people are actually in this group and these, no, you know, there's no right answer, but it's, it's sort of a useful way for us to sort of understand, you know, what, what species have common traits and, and things like that. It's, there's no right answer, but it's a sort of an obvious grouping that like, I'm more similar to a monkey than I am to a fish, right? It's just sort of obvious, right? Okay, uh, information retrieval, someone has the query movie, you'll see, you know, the user intents fall into four general categories. Some people looking for theaters, some people looking for the stars in the movies, some people want to see trailers, some people see reviews. And you know, all the web pages that have theaters sort of look the same. And they sort of look different from the web pages that have the stars on them, right? So you sort of see this obvious grouping. Climate, right? There's always regions of similar climate. People say this is this type of climate, okay? Where's the boundary? Where's the real boundary? There's no real boundary, but it just sort of, those regions are all very similar. Uh, you can look at patterns of disease, and in business, you always Segment, segment customers, right? These are the, the 20 to 30 year olds, and they have different buying patterns than the 30 to 40. What's special about the number 30? Nothing, but it's a useful segmentation. Okay, so when we do clustering again, often cluster for understanding. Those examples are from the previous slide. Sometimes people cluster for utility, right? It can be useful or meaningful or both. Well, when is it useful? Well, you can summarize data, and some different algorithms will run faster when you just use the data as summarized by clusters. So some of the clustering techniques are what are called prototype methods. And so for each cluster, you can say, well, I'm just going to take this one point to represent everyone in the cluster. I'm going to take this one point to represent everyone in the cluster. And so then if you had, you know, 100 clusters, you could just run your algorithm on the 100 clusters as opposed to the millions of data in each one of those clusters. Also, just not just for running algorithms, but for compressing data, right? If you could just keep the cluster centers around and throw out the rest of the data, then, you know, you have a lot less data to store. So don't take a random sample of the data, just take, you know, these prototypes from the data that are the cluster centers. And also, if you do clustering, you can speed up the, the nearest neighbor algorithms. Okay. So how many clusters is always the question that you can never answer, right? Because there's no algorithm is really going to tell you what the right number of clusters is. Once you decide on the number of clusters, you can write down objective functions and minimize, maximize them. But you usually have to decide ahead of time how many clusters you're looking for. So you say, okay, well, that's obvious. There's two clusters there, right? But then you say, well, but really, you know, these guys are sort of broken off and these guys are sort of broken off. So you say, okay, there's four. And then someone else says, yeah, but I see a division here and I see a division here. And someone else says there's six, right? So there's no real truth to that one. You generally, with most clustering techniques have to have some notion ahead of time of how many clusters you're looking for. So that's one thing to keep in mind. 
Uh, the most common popular technique is probably k-means clustering. In this one, each cluster is associated with a centroid. This is often the mean, as in k-means, although we'll leave it general and call it centroid. It could be the median or something like that. And this center is the cluster prototype, right? So this cluster here, you know, where's the mean? It's right here. That's sort of the prototype value for the cluster. And this cluster over here, where's its mean? Well, that's right here. So it's sort of like the prototype value for that cluster. Okay, each point is assigned to the cluster with the closest centroid. So a new point is here. Where does it go? It goes here because that has the closest of these two centroids. That one's the closest. Again, the number of clusters K must be specified ahead of time. K means won't choose K for you. Okay, so how do you do K means clustering? Well, this is sort of cute. So maybe I'll draw a little bit better picture here so I can point at it. So you minimize this error function which is basically the distance of every point to its center squared. Okay, so if I had two clusters, here's all these points, okay, and they're all in the same cluster, and they all have center right here. Let's make that the center. And so I'm going to measure the distance of each one of these points, how far is each one of these points to its center, square those things, and I'm going to do that for all k clusters. So then the other cluster is over here, and their center is right here, so I'm going to take the sum of all their square distances from their center. Okay, so now I'm trying to minimize this thing over what? I'm trying to minimize it over two things, over the selection of cluster centers, what two points should I pick for cluster centers, and the cluster membership. For every point I get to say which center is he going to map to. So I'm trying to minimize this objective function over cluster membership and cluster center selection. Okay, well just saying that by itself sort of suggests a cute algorithm, right? For a given set of cluster centers, right? So I'm trying to find cluster membership and centers to minimize this thing. Okay, the whole, that whole space. But if you told me the cluster centers, right? If you told me, oh, you know, let me just get it wrong. Like this is the cluster center here and this is the cluster center here. If you told me those were gonna be the cluster centers, then sort of the uh, cluster membership is obvious, right? Everyone who's the closest to this one should go to this one and everyone who's the closest to this one should go to that one, right? Because I'm trying to minimize the sum of distances squared. So you you pick the smallest distance. You get, for every point you have two choices, pick the smaller one. So once you know the centers, the cluster membership is obvious. Okay, also, once you know the cluster membership, the center is obvious, right? If I tell you these points are all going to be assigned to a single cluster, and these points are all going to be assigned to a single cluster, well then it's just a problem of saying, what's the single value in that cluster that will minimize the sum of the square distances. Well, if you go around here and find any single point where all the distances to it and you sum them up and square them is minimized, that's of course the mean, right? The mean minimizes, is the single point that minimizes the sum of the square differences. So if I know the cluster membership, I know what the center should be, it should be the mean. And so this sort of suggests the algorithm, just iterate over these two things. Start with two centers, determine your cluster membership by mapping everyone to their closest point. Then take that cluster membership and figure out the new centers by taking the mean. With those new centers, figure out your cluster membership again and just keep iterating in this, in this manner. And it turns out generally this algorithm will converge and it will converge to the solution that minimizes this thing. So that's sort of a very simple algorithm for solving k-means clustering. Okay, so that's algorithm 8.1 in the book. Basically, again, select your k equal to, in my example, points as the initial centers. Form your cluster membership by going to the closest point. Then recompute your, your centroid by taking you know, the mean of your clusters and the, based on your cluster membership assignment. And just keep iterating this until you converge, right? It's sort of like a just converge and you say, okay, this is under my convergence threshold and so I'm done, okay? Other algorithms exist that are sort of more intelligent, but this one works, generally. And on the homework, I actually put a problem to do this in one dimension. So in R, the function k-means does k-means clustering. It's in the base package. You actually don't need to read in any special package or library. So just to illustrate that, I have sort of a toy data set here. Let me sort of show you my toy data set. It's just a two-dimensional data with like 100 rows. Let's see, and two columns, obviously. Okay, so here's my data. And I'm gonna cluster this data. And just say, yeah, there's 100, okay. And what did I say to do? I said, basically make a picture of the k equal two solution from the k-means. Plot the data, plot the fitted cluster centers using a different color. Finally, use k and n. I'm gonna use k and n. This is just sort of a trick, right? Because k-means will tell me the cluster 
centers, but then I want to know who belongs to what cluster. Well, you belong to the, close, the cluster with the closest center, so I'm just going to use KNN, which defaults to K nearest neighbor 1, to find what the closest center is and then color you accordingly. So color the points according to the cluster membership. So here I do that, basically read in the data, header equal false, make a plot of the data. Let me, I'll do that much so you can see what the data looks like. It's basically two pretty well-defined clusters when you look at in um, two dimensions. Oh, you know, the one thing I haven't really said, which I should talk about, so, okay, so there you see the, the two, you know, arguably this is a cluster and this is a cluster. And then the next thing I do is to call k-means, and then k-means is going to give me back the optimal cluster centers, which then I plot here in the color blue with that cx equal 2 means to make a big plotting symbol. So this is what k-means found. The k-means algorithm in R said this is one cluster center and this is another cluster center, right? There's, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. There's no label on the points, but it sort of identified this as a group belonging to this center and this is a group belonging to this center. And so then the last thing to say is, well, who belongs to which cluster, right? Does this guy belong here or belong here? Well, you belong to the, the, the cluster with the nearest center. So the trick, you know, I'm just sort of, instead of computing all the distances myself, I'm just going to use K and N. And remember how K and N goes. It goes training data, test data, training labels. So I'm just going to say the training data are just the two centers. And then the test data is x. So it's going to map x to the closest point in the training data. So it's going to take every x and map it to the nearest center. And then I just sort of create some fake labels for those two, those two centers, right? Call one negative one and the other one. And then I'm going to color the points accordingly, x, and color it so if this thing, whatever value this thing is, will be one of them. And then plus one will be the other one. And use plotting character equal to 19. And then this should color in the cluster membership for me. You could go through and compute the distances yourself, but I'll just let KNN do it for me because it's probably faster, whoever wrote that code. And there's the cluster membership, right? So obviously everyone's just going to the closest closest one. You know, are you right? Well, you've minimized your objective function, but again, there's no really right or wrong answer for this. It's right to the extent that it's meaningful or useful or both, as your book says. And so it's, you know, one of the reasons maybe it's not such a hot research area is because it's not like a question of who can build the better mousetrap. But in practice, you know if you have a clustering technique that's useful to you because it'll provide you some utility and you'll be able to learn about your data from it. The one thing I haven't said, okay, sort of doing this in sort of this fake two-dimensional problem hides a lot. In general, for your data, and this is true with a lot of things like nearest neighbor, too, you need to have some notion of distance, right? So when x1 and x2 are continuous valued and on the same scale, Euclidean distance makes a lot of sense. If x were binary, or x were ordinal, or x were some categorical variable, it's not obvious how you want to compute distances, and that's sort of the real trick. <laughs> Chapter 2, Section 4 talks a lot about how to compute similarities and dissimilarities between all different types of variables, and I would encourage you to look at that. We didn't really spend too much time on it, but it's sort of a difficult problem in and of itself, how you define distances between x values in an arbitrary space. And to do clustering, that's sort of the thing that you have to get right. Once you get that right, sort of the clustering algorithms tend to be pretty straightforward. But you do have to say, what is my notion of distance? You know, what is the notion of distance between these two points in the x space? It's not always obvious how you're going to define that. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. Since uh, Euclidean distance corresponds to log likelihood, log likelihood mm -hmm. normal distributions, do some people for like categorical variables, do they use like log likelihood of like yeah. the discrete distribution? I'm not sure. So the question is, so in here we're using uh, Euclidean distance. And actually, you can map this into be it's the maximum likelihood solution, isn't it, if these are bivariate normal, I, I believe. Yeah. So you can, ma you can map this into a maximum likelihood problem. So Charles's question is, if I had different types of data that weren't continuous, could I map it into a likelihood framework and say that I ought to maximize the likelihood function in that model? Makes sense? I'm not sure. but. That would be my approach, I think, now that you said it. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. OK, so I think, um, yeah, that's all I was going to say about everything. So any comments, questions, anything? General question. Mm -hmm. Are the uh, PDF and homeworks and so on on stuff202.com going to stay up a while, or should yeah. we like, grab nope. copies? I will, I, will leave them, I will leave them up until until it gets close to next summer or until 
I have some strong reason where I need to take them down. But I, I, I think that if I take them down, I'll receive a lot of random emails from people mm -hmm. yeah, asking the for them. Are out, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So I'm going to try and leave them up until sort of the last minute, like maybe a month before next summer starts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so the question was, is the stats202.com web page going to stay intact? And the plan is that it will until 2000, what's next year, 2008? 2008, about May. May 2008 should stay intact until then. Okay, well, thanks for coming, and uh, take care. Bye-bye.